ladies. I'm doing the Bible study here in my house and um, I'm back in the guest bedroom in case any of you guys ever stay here. You're getting a little bit of a preview, but I, I really miss you so much and um, I've been up since early this morning. It's weird how Sunday mornings my body's just programmed to get up really early and start praying and start preparing for Sunday mornings. And I was just visualizing you guys while I was doing this lesson and I could just see where everyone was sitting and my heart was just so full and so happy and I've been praying for each of you. And um, I just love you so much and I miss you, I miss seeing your faces. But I'm so full of hope that um, very, very, very soon we're gonna see each other again. And when we do, man, we are gonna so much um, love each other even all the more because of this time we've been apart. So I wanna finish our series, um, um, week eight of Beloved Bride. And it's really ironic, you'll see when we get into the lesson um, how, funny it is the timing of everything considering what this lesson is actually talking about so but um as always i'm going to begin with just the reading of the scriptures and then i'll get into the time of prayer and then i'll get into the teaching of the lesson so the scriptures for today are isaiah 26 verses 20 through 21 it says um it tells us of this time come my people Enter our chambers and shut the door behind you. Hide yourselves, as it were, for a time, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. In Revelation 6, 1, where it says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, Come. I'm going to pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you so much that no matter where we are, Lord, you're in our presence. You're in our midst. We thank you, Lord, that you're here. We're in the chamber right now. You've literally got us in our chambers. And yet you're telling us, come, come to me in our hearts know that there's something different about what's happening right now, Lord. That there's uh, almost like a line being drawn and where we are being forced to either stay in our comfortable places or come to you, Lord. Oh, Father, I pray that we come to you, Lord. I pray that we don't stay in our comfortable places where we, we literally get shaken out until we just come to you, Lord. Father God, I pray for you to forgive us that it takes sometimes a shaking for us to come to you, Lord. But I thank you in your mercy that you allow whatever it takes to get us to come to you, Jesus. We thank you that we are your bride. We thank you that you're preparing us for a day when we're going to see you face to face, that you make us ready for our wedding day and that there's nothing we can do to prepare ourselves, but that you alone give us the righteous garments with which to dress ourselves, Lord. We thank you that you know how to prepare us better than we know how to prepare ourselves. We love you. I pray, Father God, that you would just be with me as I speak these words. I, I don't have the words to say in and of myself. I am dust, as your word says. I am but dust. But would you breathe on me so that I could know what I can only know with you? Would you empower me through your Holy Spirit so I could speak what only you could say? And would you enable me to speak words that uphold and uplift us and help us come to you? Because I know that's your desire. We love you and we praise you. And it's in your holy, 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 precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Okay, so if you haven't done your homework yet, you will be coming to it shortly um, when you get to week seven, which is all about the number um, seven, which is um, ironic. And um, so 
what's happened with the bride at this time is when we left off last time, she had come into the bridal chamber. She had started the second part of her wedding where she went into the bridal chamber with her husband and the the wedding was consummated and the the fulfillment of everything that both the bridegroom and the bride had been longing for was coming to fruition. And what happens is when she exits that bridal chamber, she went in veiled. When she exits, she is unveiled because she has finally become one with her husband and she no longer needs to be veiled because her husband has fully become her covering and she no longer needs a covering because he is her covering and he has fully become her covering. And so the most beautiful thing happens after that. Um, after she comes out unveiled, she will uh, circle him like this seven times. She'll do it seven times while he stands there and she'll circle him seven times uh, before they um, finalize and then before they have the great feast. Um, so when she comes out unveiled and she walks around him seven times, it's not to say that my life is going to fully revolve around you for the rest of our days, although it will. And, and part of it is pointing to that, but she, what she's really alluding to is that my life already revolves around you. And so when she's revolving around him, then she's displaying to everyone, I already revolve around him. So there's a completion that she is displaying to all of the guests at that point, saying, I already revolve around him. He and I are already one, and I'm circling him to show you the, um, now you're seeing the fulfillment of what already just took place. We became one, we're covenant one, and we are fully one and now you get to see the manifestation of that and I love that because sometimes and even in times like this it just feels sometimes like we're circling we're circling Jesus and sometimes it feels like man there's a place I know you're trying to get me God but I just can't seem to land in it I just can't seem to land where you're trying to take me but whenever I think about this and there's something that happens when you get alone with him in your in his word where it feels like you're finally able to land in him and you're finally able to give get your heart at rest in him and sometimes God knows how it is to match his word with our circumstances to where we can finally rest in him and we can finally land in where it is he's trying to take us and there's something about what's happening right now and what's happening not only in the world, but in the spirit where he's just saying, it's time to revolve around me. A lot of, a lot of us have been revolving around things in the world, things in our circumstances, maybe even idols we didn't know we had. And he's saying, I'm going to shake all that away because it's time to revolve around me because you're about to see me face to face. And it's the bride is to circle her bridegroom because he is the only one worthy of us fully revolving around. He is the one that we were made to revolve around. And he's saying, come on, come on, it's time. And there's something super duper exciting about that. And I love, I love what he's doing in this time. Even though it's terrifying, I love it because he's so active and he's making us so inactive so he could be so active in his church. And it just thrills my heart. It thrills my heart, even though it scares me because it's so uncomfortable. But God is not worried about our uncomfort. He is mostly worried about us being finished in the spirit more than he's worried about our fleshly comfort. And that's where we need to be worried about too, is being finished in the spirit, even if it means we have to be uncomfortable in our flesh. So she walks around him seven times. The, in my commentary, seven represents an expression of God's fullness and diversity of his work in the church. And in many places, it, rep, it represents the church itself. Divine perfection. It expresses the perfect oneness in spirit. So this, um, this period of um, seven day period is also called the week of the bride. Um, and I read, I read to you 
already of Isaiah 26, um, 20 through 21, it tells us of this time, come my people, enter the chamber, shut the door behind you, hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. This is what this is referring to is there's a time coming. The next thing on the kingdom calendar that we're waiting for is the rapture, the snatching away of the bride. And there's going to be a seven year period where this the the week of the bride is going to happen. We're waiting on that right now. And I believe this is just me, but I believe what we're seeing happen in the world or is maybe a, alluding to of that. I'm not saying that this is already happening, but I'm saying that God does things to prepare us and say, hey, get ready. I may be coming and I'm not sure um, exactly what's happening, but I know that everything God's doing is to point us to his son and to point us to the truth of his word. And his truth is the most real thing that's happening in this world right now. And, and it's we're wise to pay attention to the word of God right now, especially in this day and time. Daniel 9, 27 speaks of a one week agreement with the Antichrist in which there will be a seven year interval um, that will begin the countdown. And, Dev, and Daniel nine twenty seven it says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So right here, there's an allusion to that seven-year period of time that's going to happen. But we don't have to worry about that because we won't be on earth during that time. There's a seven-year period that's going to be happening here on earth. But the church and the bride, the bride, which is the church, will be in that time where we're going to enter the bridal chamber. And um, uh, seven also represents a time of completeness, but also a time of completeness in the spirit. So it's not just, so there's two things going on. There's a completeness in time here on earth. And we know that time here on earth is a created thing that happened at the beginning back in Genesis. But time has a completion. It's got a beginning and an end. But um, so, but there's a complete work in the spirit. So God is completing the work in his spirit in us so that we can be ready to see him face to face. And there's, a, there's, there's circumstances that happen where he allows time and pressure to prepare us for meeting for the complete work he's doing in us in the spirit. In Revelation 1-4, Revelation 3-1, Revelation 4-5, and Revelation 5-7, we see the this um, allusion to seven over and over again. We see the seven lamps, the seven seals, the seven torches of fire, the seven stars, the seven days of the week, the seven years of tribulation, and the seven days with his bride. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about Revelation 5, 1-10. through 10. Because we see here that there's a scroll that John saw that um, he had a very profound revelation of the Lamb of God that being passed a scroll with seven seals on it. And um, this is really, really important. And this really um, it touched my heart. And I want to, because of this, I want to go into a little bit more depth because whenever we see the Lamb of God, um, slain from before the foundation of the world. That is our bridegroom. And there's something really cool here that has to do um, with us that I want to talk about. So right now in our Bibles, we're going to go to Revelation 5 verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to go there in my Bible. It says, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, and a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? 
and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though if it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes. And with it, were the, with it are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, from every language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And I'm going to stop right there for a minute and just unpack this a little bit because what's happening here is right before this i'm going to jump back a little bit to revelation 4 and i guess it's a it's important to go back a little bit um there was um in, 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 in Revelation 4, 11, um, it says, Then I looked and I heard the throne of the living creatures and the elders and the voice of the angels. Oh, never mind. I already read that. I'm so sorry. I'm getting back. But what was happening is John was having this experience where he was seeing, he was, he was in heaven and he was seeing the scroll. And they were, they were looking around and there was not anyone found that could open the scroll. And it says he began to weep. He began to weep because, and um, he be, John began to realize what was happening was that that scroll represented us. It represented the future of our future. Not just the future of people, but the spiritual future of people because we were connected in the beginning to God and this, and we were separated. Sin separated us from God. So there was, there was man and there was God, but there was no connection at all. And so when it says there was no one found worthy to open the scroll, that's what they were saying. And John realized that. He said he began to weep because he was like, we are doomed. There's no way that we could ever have any connection back to what I'm seeing right now. There's no one. There's no one that can connect us back to God. And his, he began to weep loudly because he realized, oh my goodness, there's nothing. There's nothing to connect us because heaven is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But we are not holy. We are sinners. And there's no way sinners that are completely stained can enter heaven that is holy, holy, holy. But then they said, weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And what, G and, and, and what did he show up? He showed up as a lamb that had been slain. And he showed up with the, the seven horns. And he showed up with the seven eyes. And that was representing us, the church. So he showed up as a lamb that was slain, representing the one who conquered. How did he conquer? He conquered by dying. He conquered by wearing our sin and bear and dying on a cross for it. And the reason why he was able to take that scroll was because he was the one who bore all of our sin. He was the one who touched earth bore our sin and reached up to heaven and ransomed us. And that is a cool, cool revelation of Jesus. So much so that when he not he was slain for it, and then not only that, but when he ransomed us, he was able to be one with us. So much so that when he's seen here represented as a lamb that was slain, he is 
seen with the horns and the eyes representing us, the church. So that, remember in our Bible study, I've always said, when Jesus sees you, he does not see himself apart from you. He sees himself as one with you. And so our job is to see ourselves as one with him. And, and when we, I talked about before, when I said, let us see ourselves as real to Jesus as the scars, because when, when we get to heaven, we're going to see him and his scars are real. We're not going to have any scars in heaven, but he will. But what we see here is not only we see another uh, picture of him that shows not just the scars, but we see him representing wearing the church. In this picture that where John sees him, he's he's wearing, um, he's physically representing as wearing the church. And it's just so cool the way scripture shows that. The way that scripture shows that. Um, I love that. And so, anyway, but that was what I wanted to, to show you because, and I know in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. If Jesus had never come for us and never become the land that was slain, we don't have a future and a hope. We do not have a future and a hope. And I know sometimes right now it feels like, Lord, do I have a future and a hope? right now with everything going on and I struggle with this too because it, it, when I, I try to not let myself these days think too much beyond the day I'm in because Jesus is I am so I try to stay in the present tense with him because if I get into tomorrow I get into trouble but he is my future and the hope and I have to remember my hope is in him he is my future he is my hope but without that lamb I don't even have that and I would be a wreck right now if I didn't have that I would be a wreck right now because my only future and hope would be here in this world. And there is no hope in that. This world is temporary. Time is temporary. But he is eternal and he is forever. Because of he was really here and he was really slain. And he is really with us. And he is really one with us. We have an amazing future and hope. So basically to sum that up, if there's no land, there's no hope. But we are less because there is a lamb that was slain. Therefore, we have every reason to have hope. He is one with us and he, we can be, we are one with him. So when we ask God what's going on, we could just as easily say what's going on is I'm making sure you know you are one with me. I'm making sure you know you are one with me and it may feel completely uncomfortable for you right now. It was completely com uncomfortable for Jesus to be made one with us. And so we can't be rattled when it gets uncomfortable for us to, when he makes us do everything it takes to realize that we are one with him. Because it's not comfortable to be crucified. And we, we should all know that by now. We know that the word kala, uh, our bride, doesn't even exist. It's a Hebrew word in the Bible that represents bride. There's also another word that doesn't exist in the word um, shatan, which means groom. Um, God didn't think that those words were necessary, so he didn't ever invent them. <laughs> um, there is, I, just as your teacher, you know, you have to check up on me. Um, there are two references to these, so you can check up, but there are references to son-in-law and um, daughter-in-law. And um, just so you know, there's, um, if you ever want to look into these, one of them is in Genesis 9, 19, 12, where it says, referring to Lot, whenever um, Sodom and Gomorrah was getting ready to be destroyed, and the angels were asking him, is there anyone else here? And he was talking about a son-in-law. Um, and so there's reference to that in Genesis nineteen twelve, and that is the word shatan. Um, or in Genesis 38, 11, um, this is where uh, Judah and Tamar um, got into some trouble. And, um, and so it said, the scripture there says, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and there's the word Kala right there, uh, remain a widow at your father's house. And so there is a, this word in here, but it's referring to a daughter-in-law, not, not a bride. So... Um, there is a, a word for bride in Greek, which is nymphae, 
um, from the verb nupto, which is, means a veiled young married woman. To veil is, um, it, in a, a veiled woman is considered a bride. Um, so, okay, now I'm going to, um, we're going to go over to Isaiah 43, 1 through 4, and we're going to talk about um, a little bit more about what it is to be his, because that's what I believe he is, he's doing with us right now. And that's, there, it's one thing to believe that, it's one thing to, to, to say, I am his. It's another thing to actually believe it in our hearts. But I believe what he's after right now is us getting to that point where we actually know that we know that we know that we're his. And so when I'm going to read Isaiah 43, 1 through 4. And I may go a little bit beyond this because these are some really sweet words. These are actually, um, Isaiah 43, 1 is one of my very, very, it's one of my life verses and one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And I'll explain to you why in a little bit. But it says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Whenever you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will, this is where I'm going a little bit beyond because this, I know someone needs to hear this. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up and, the, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. I know what it's like to not only be someone that was one of those that was lost as far as the east is from the west and maybe to have a relative that was praying for me and saying, Lord, is there any hope that she's ever going to come home? And part of the reason that I didn't come home for so long is because I was out there looking for someone to belong to. And um, I didn't know that God, that I already belonged to God. And I didn't know that he, when he looked at me, he would, he was already saying, you're mine, you're mine, Rhonda. And I didn't know how to feel that in my heart. And it took a long time for me to get there. It took a, it took me getting to the very, 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 very bottom and empty of myself. And it took me getting to the dredges of the pit of flesh because I went around looking for any single person that I could belong to except for God because I did not trust him because I had been hurt so many by so many people and I began to think if people can hurt me then God can hurt me and um and it just it came it took it took me getting to a point of complete desperation to where there was no other place to turn to where I was like the prodigal son in there with the pig pen and I was starving and I just said, there's no other place, God, if you're real, you better come help me. And he was waiting and he, for me and he met me in that moment and he was real for me in that moment. And I just, it took a little tiny mustard seed of faith for me to step out of that pig pen and began to this journey with him that I'm still on today. And and it was even a long time after that before there was one day when, and I remember how scary it was. Um, I remember reading in Revelation about where there's a stone, what he, he'll give us in heaven for those who overcome that has our, a new name on it that only he and I know. And I thought, oh, that sounds amazing. But I don't know if I'm going to overcome because I, I still battle with fear of who I am to God because I still have that sense of insecurity of belonging 
but it's nothing like it was in the very beginning. Um, but that's, that's, that's where he and I are always going to is that mountain of insecurity that he's given me a deep security in who he is. But I remember the first time and I felt so afraid to ask him this, but I just said, God, do you have a name for me? Do you have a name for me? And it felt like it, that to me felt like such a brave question. But I said, if you have a name for me, can you please tell me what it is? Because I want to know it. And I didn't hear an answer right away. But about a few days later, I was driving to work the next day. Uh, not the next day, a few days later. And um, when I, I was a school counselor at the time, and there was this overpass I would drive over where a sun, the sun would be rising. And it was at that moment when the sun was rising and I was listening to this song by Casting Crowns that says, um, I, I am yours. And um, right when I was going over that overpass, it said, he said, your name for me is mine. Your name for me is mine, Rhonda. And it was so simple, but I just burst into tears. I completely lost it because there's, it's, it, that's what I needed and I that I didn't even know I needed. I needed to hear that word that I belonged to God, that he was my father and that he had me and that he was going to take care of me. And there was so much, it was like, I felt like I belonged to someone for the first time in my life. And when I felt like that, it felt like all the things I was trying to hold on to and trying to make happen for me, I got to let go of because they were his problem because I belonged to him and I had a daddy and I had someone taking responsibility for me for the first time in my life. And it felt amazing. And I could hardly get myself together that whole day. I was so overwhelmed by the love of God. And that's why this scripture is so meaningful to me because he, I didn't even know the scripture was in the Bible until later on that week he by provident he providentially allowed me to find it where he says but now thus says the lord who created you and i could just put my name there oh rhonda who formed you oh rhonda fear not i have redeemed you i have called you by name you are mine this broken down messed up jacked up past girl that is so scared gets to belong to god and he gets to say you are mine you're my kid i got you and that's what he's saying to each of us right now. Even right now in this crazy situation. You're my kid. I got you. Don't you worry about a thing. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, you're going to be uncomfortable. But you're mine. You're mine. Don't you forget whose you are. When you know whose you are, a lot of stuff just falls into place. A lot of this and this just fades into the, the distance. And then our kids. The other thing is because... I was really messed up and sometimes we need to remember who not only who we belong to but who our kids belong to and just say you know what God you got them too and even if they end up like Rhonda did in a pig pen it's okay because they may need to get in that pig pen to realize they are yours they are yours you've got them Lord you've got them and you're not gonna let them go you're not going to let them go, even if they end up in a hospital all by themselves and you can't get to them. You've got them and you're not going to let them go. It's okay. It's hard for the mama heart. It's hard for the mama heart. And but sometimes it's necessary to let go and let God. And I know sometimes us mama hearts need to hear that. I know this mama heart needs to hear that pretty often. <laughs> and so... <sighs> okay. So, and verses, um, there's also another couple of verses in that chapter, um, verses 18 and 19, it says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make rivers in the desert. And sometimes it just does feel like a wilderness, like you don't know the way, but we know the one who knows the way. And that's all we need to know right now. And I don't know any other time in history where it, it, it feels more like a wilderness right now than any other time in history. 
but I know the one who is the way. And that's okay. And that's okay. It reminds me of John in 14 where the disciples were asking him, are you going to show us the way? If you, if you show us the way, if you show us the Father, then we'll be okay. And Jesus was like, have you been with me all this time? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And sometimes we just want that path so bad. We want him to say, here's the list of one, two, three, A, B, C, D, and he's never going to do that. He's never going to. He's going to say, Jesus is the way. And it's always by faith. Just like the Israelites in the very beginning, he, he, what did he give them? He gave them a cloud by day and a fire by night. And they didn't get to know the path. They got to follow a source. And that's us. We get to follow a source. And our source is the word, our word, Jesus, our living word. We don't get to see. We get, we get what we see right in front of us is Jesus. And that's it. And that's enough. He is our sufficiency. I'm going to jump over to Ruth because when we talk about the bride and the covering and the sufficiency of God, we are going to um, look right here and we're going to see something here that points us back to that. So um, I'm, we're going to go to Ruth um, 3 verses 14 through 18. If you'll go there with me. And what's happening here is that um, Ruth, I know many of you already know the story of Ruth, but Naomi, just to give you a little backstory that, um, sorry, I was checking to see if this is still recording. Um, Naomi had been going through a rough time. She, They were kind of going through a time like we're going through now, but she and her sons and her husband, and they decided to leave. They were like, this place is not treating us well and there's you know famine coming on here so we're going to go somewhere else and where when they left um she ended up her husband died and her sons died and um she, all she had were these daughter-in-laws and she told them to go ahead and leave but this one daughter-in-law would not leave her which was um Ruth and so um so Naomi's like look go ahead and go there's nothing i have for you i'm just going to go home back to my people and, um, but, um, Ruth would not leave her. And so she ended up, when she came back home to her, her, um, um, Israel, she ended up finding that there was a, they had a kinsman redeemer and this kinsman redeemer, Boaz seemed to like Ruth, take a liking to her. And so that's kind of where we're picking up. So we're getting to verses, um, 14 and 18 because Naomi is given Ruth some, I, some, I, an idea here that ties in with what we're learning about the bride. It says, um, so she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you were wearing and hold it out. And so she held it, and he measured one six measures of barley and put it on her. And then she went into the city. And when, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, The six measures of barley he gave to me, for he... That these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty handed to your mother in law. And she replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until uh, for the man will not will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So we're gonna go there first. But that verse where we're gonna look at where it says, How did you fare? In Hebrew she is saying, What is your name? Is your name still Ruth or did you take his name? She's saying, what is your name? What, isn't that cool? I love that. And so um, Jesus is asking us when we get all wrapped up in us, we get all wrapped up in us. And this ties in what we're talking about in Isaiah 43. He's saying, what's your name? Are you not mine? Have I called you by name? You have been bought with a price. Don't you forget you're mine. And because you're mine, you live above this world right now. Even though I haven't physically taken you into my bridal chamber right now, you're living in my bridal chamber right now in your spirit. So you come up here and you rest in who you really are. And you remember who you really are because you are mine. You are mine. 
And so there's that line there. I hope we never forget. How did you fare? Which means what is your name? Is your name you or is your name his? Because your name, my beloved, is his. I was reading this morning in Gideon, and that it's over and over. You could see this pattern in the Bible when I saw it this morning and when I was reading Judges about Gideon. Um, and Gideon's literally terrified. He's beating out wheat and hiding it from the Midianites, be, just trying to get a little bit of wheat because they were taking everything that they had. It, he was just, just a desperate time. Um, the people had already succumbed to the Midianites, and, and he was not looking for God. He was, the people, right before that, it, it was talking about how the people were complaining to God, saying, Are you, aren't you going to come for us? We're your people. And, um, but God, God came looking for Gideon. Isn't that cool? Gideon was a looking, God came looking for Gideon because you know why? Because Gideon was his. <laughs> it's so cool how God is. And God says, mighty man of valor. And I wrote in the margin of my Bible, it's time to become who you are. Because Gideon didn't know who he was. And sometimes we don't know who we are. And God will come looking to us and say, you know who you are? You're mine. And because you're mine, this is who you are. This is who you are. You are a beloved bride. And you may not feel like it, and this may feel like the worst time in your whole life, but it's not because you're mine. you got to remember who you are and become who you are. And Gideon becomes who he is because God said it. And sometimes God's told us who we are, and we just haven't actually believed it yet. But he's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to decide that what he said was real and starting waiting for us to start revolving around what he said instead of revolving around what we're hearing up in here in our stinking, stinking mind. So when Judges 6.10 is reminding the people who he really is, he says, and in and, and Judges 6.10, he says, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And God's telling us that same thing. Don't fear. Don't fear the, the, the things that are happening in the land you dwell. But, but you have not obeyed my voice. And the thing is, is that when we're not abiding in who God says we are, we're going to fear. We're going to fear what's going on in our land. We really, really are. We're going to revolve. What we revolve around determines what we fear. And so when we're revolving around ourselves and our land, we're going to catch on the fears that are happening here because we're stuck in time. And time and all this world is passing away right now. And it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. But when we start revolving around who we really are and God, who is above time and above this land and above this world, it's going to get better and better and better, no matter how bad it gets here. Because he's going to mount us up with wings like eagles and we're going to run and not grow weary. And we're going to start living our love story with Jesus because that's what he called us into. He called us into his story, his story, not this world story, his story. We're just here temporarily. We're temporary residents here, but we're spiritual beings that are part of his story that's going to be happening 10 billion years from now when this world is long gone. Okay, so who we are who we revolve around determines where our focus goes, and where our focus goes determines where our life goes. If it's not God, then we're going to fear, because God's the only one who overcomes our fears. Ruth 3.18, when I was reading commentary on this, it said that word, this is really, really cool. It means settled, when he says he's not going to rest until this is settled. That word actually is kala, which is that word we talked about earlier. Um, which has to do with the bride, but more of a daughter-in-law sense. Um, it means to finish, to complete, to fulfill, to bring this matter to an end. The primary meaning of Kala is to consummate, to bring to completion. Moaz, Boaz will not finish his task working until the goal is accomplished. Sometimes the idea of exhaustion, of being entirely consumed, is signified in this verb. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He was entirely consumed to the end of himself to attain us. Um, it just completely vanished. Naomi was confident that Boaz would not rest until he had completely settled the matter. So Kala is the word for bride, which in the daughter-in-law sense, so there's actually a word play here because 
um, which, which is cool because Ruth is actually Naomi's daughter-in-law. And so it's cool the way God works things out and he has, he gives us little hints of things. He's, he's so brilliant in his word. I saw a quote, um, a while back that made me think about all this, that faith is living without scheming. So whenever Whenever I talk about revolving around us instead of revolving around God, I notice that whenever I'm revolving around me, I can tell. Even when I'm thinking it's about God, but I start pushing God. I start trying to scheme with Him. I start trying to say, God, if you do boom, 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 then I'll do boom. Or, if I, or else I'll say, God, if I do boom, then you're going to do boom, 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 boom. And that's not how He works. That is never how He works. He says, you be still. And you know that I am God. You be still and you know that I'm God. I do not play human games. You do not scheme with me. I do not play. You are Israel. He who has already overcome with God and with man. And when you stand in that, there is a power already there that we don't have to scheme because we've already won the war. We just stand in his victory already. That scheming is all out of unbelief. And who we know we really are already with him. So we can tell who we're revolving around by what we're doing in here. And who we're trying to pick and prod and umpire based on our thought life. Even our thought life with God. Because sometimes we can think we're walking with God. But what we're really doing is trying to umpire him. And that is not a relationship with God at all. There's a difference. Um. If we're trying to play God in our lives, if we're trying to get him to revolve around us instead of us revolving around him. If we can, we can truly, truly let him be God in our lives, he will be exalted and he will be with us and he will do it. He will do it just like Boaz said, I'm not going to rest until this is done. Because we can roll the stone away, but only he can raise the dead behind the stone. We can operate the slingshot, but only he can make that stone go right into the head of our enemies where they will never rise again. We can forgive and trust that person that hurt us. We can make that choice and say, I'm going to forgive them and put, take that first step of faith towards it. But only God can give us the love and compassion for them that we didn't even know was possible. If we're, that when we see that person, we'll actually feel something for them that is not even humanly possible considering what they have done to us or to our loved ones. We can pick up the cross just in faith, just barely pick it up, but he will give us the power and the strength to carry it and to keep moving forward and even giving us the benefits of his own strength in our lives. There's something that I live by and that I've heard at this quote a long time ago from Adrian Rogers. It says, when we are on the throne, he is on the cross. That means that when we're on the throne, you can might as well just consider, oh, here goes my water, consider Jesus powerless. He's not moving when you're on the throne because he won't. But when, when he is on the throne, you're on the cross. And we're either letting him live in one of those directions all the time. So I want to live where I'm on the cross and God is on the throne because I know I'm powerless. I can do nothing to change my life or my family or my circumstances. But I, when I'm, the only thing I can do is get up on the cross. That's the only power I have. And say, Jesus, you're on the throne. And I'm going to stand here and rest in you. And I'm going to be your branch. And I'm going to let you extend your spirit life through me. And through me, you will bear fruit. Fruit that will remain. But if I move out of that, nothing's going to happen. So my job here is to rest in him and to let him be who he is through me so that there will be fruit through my life, fruit that will bear fruit here on earth. And that is powerful. That is the most powerful thing we can do during this time. It's not the worst thing in the world to begin right now living the crucified life. He's preparing his bride. He's preparing us. He is dressing us up in himself. He is preparing us for home. Because we're going to see him. Who knows? It could even be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. Or it could be 10 years from now. But we're going to see him face to face. And when you see him face to face, it's not going to matter how uncomfortable your life was. All that's going to matter is that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Wow, you are radiant. You're radiant in righteousness. And the righteousness isn't anything you did. It's because you let me be who my, you lived out of oneness in me. And look at this fruit that all came about because you abided in me. That's all that's going to matter in that moment. That's it. Nothing else will matter except for that. Don't you want to get that right while we're here? I was thinking about this a, a while back and I wrote a poem. Just thinking about this moment. And of course, this was when I was going through a struggle. But I keep think, I've been thinking about this poem lately. And actually, even before this situation came up. So I'm just going to read it to you. And this is actually how we're going to close out. And, and I just want you ladies to know I love you so much. I'm here for you. Um, I'm going to be posting little teaching videos on our um, website, www.perfectmess.org. And, of course, you have my email. You have my phone number. Um, I love you so very much. And I am here for you. And um, I'm praying for you daily. But if you need a person to talk to, I am. I have nothing else to do. I'm sitting out in the swing. I've prayed with many of you already. But I'm here if you need prayer. I love you so much. I'm thinking of you daily. Please pray for me and my family as well. Um, we need your prayers, and I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful that we got to finish this study. We got we got to the down or walk down the wedding aisle together, and I'm so thankful. So I'm going to read this poem and pray, and then hopefully um, we'll be seeing you face to face really soon. Sitting here right now in tears, overwhelmed by all that's taken place, I could see it all so clearly now, moment by moment, grace by grace. All my frustrated, angry tears, the confusing twists and turns, all my so-called wasted years, when your will was all I yearned, and right here, and here we are, right now, right here, I hear your voice so loud, my love was all you've ever sought, your one call in me finally found, so often severely misunderstood, whose love is it again? I did my best to do it all to make everyone my friend, only to fall in exhaustion and fear, once more at holy feet, where all fears fall to heaven's floor, where love's definition becomes complete. How could I not see it then, my restless heart, so small and blind? Your presence has always been here for me, only veiled by my own mind. This mind, a constant battlefield, where I too often fail to see that this battle was already won on the cross at Calvary. I see it now all taking place, the battle's victory, and how love's banner dances in the wind, Christ's light for all to see. Love, it's always been your battle cry to us, to love each as our own, and when we finally get it right, your eternal purpose to all will be known. And then everyone in every place, every tribe and tongue will see your bride shining with your light, pure love and majesty. I can't wait for that day. Her garment knit by threads of love until each one was sewn. Moment by moment, grace by grace, you've made each one your own. Your gift of love given back to you finally returned complete never again to be veiled by doubt, by flesh struggles to compete. Oh Christ, this moment, may we all draw near to grasp what you have done, moment by moment, grace by grace, but through love you already won. I love y'all so much. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity. To just be used by you to speak your word, to pray for my sisters. And Lord, not just to walk them down the aisle, but for so many of the times they walk me down the aisle. And I feel so much pleasure and so much joy as I get a tiny, tiniest little glimpse of what it's going to be like in heaven when we are one with you. 
and we understand how one you are with us. It's so beautiful, Lord. What you're doing, just continue to do it, Lord. Just have your way with us, Lord, and we love you and we praise you. Thank you that you're getting us home. Thank you for the well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for the it is finished. And Lord, may it be done to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We praise you. And I just pray for your protection over each of these, my sisters. I pray that you just continue to bless them, nurture them, strengthen them in your Holy Spirit. Put your angel, angels around their homes, around wherever they go, Lord. Just prosper your Holy Spirit in them, Lord. We love you and just praise you, Lord. Be glorified in their lives, Lord. Let them make it all the way home. And not um, in a struggle, but in joyful, joyful marching all the way down the wedding hall with you. It's in your precious name we pray.